If you have not yet joined, please do so. You've got a little bit of time before we get to that first Pear Deck question. Now, we're going to be looking at globalization for a while. That's why we've got globalization then and now. We're going to be looking back even past the time of mechanical navigation devices like this and sailing ships, but we're also going to jump forward to the present day of satellite navigation and massive container ships carrying cargo thousands of miles and on a constant basis. The unit objectives, well, there's quite a few of them. That's because this is a big unit. It's going to be spread out over several modules. By the end, you should be able to explain what globalization is as a concept and its different components. So we're going to find out there are three major components involved in globalization, and we're going to learn about that today. You should be able to describe the key characteristics that distinguish the different stages of globalization. That sounds maybe like a lot. It's going to be okay. Some of the labels we have for these stages are fairly simple things like globalization 1.0, which makes it a little easier to sort them out. All right, Jackson, let's make sure we're doing my thing. I also need to know what has made globalization possible. And it's not just going to be things like technology, but that will be part of it. And Jackson, make sure you're in candy right in the notes, not just the Pear Deck. You're going to want both. And if you thought, now that we're out of religious conflict, we wouldn't be talking about motivations anymore. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Motivations are still going to be a part of our story. But we're going to talk about them in a more kind of straightforward way. I want to know what has led some people to be champions of globalization and others to do everything they can to slow it down or stop it. You should also be able to talk about the different consequences of globalization. What might be good, what might be bad in order for you to be able to argue intelligently and in an informed way for or against globalization. I realize coming off of yesterday's extra credit assignment where you are making an argument about who was more motivated by private or ulterior motives, the crusaders or the jihadis, you may feel like some of these arguments are just ways for me to see what you know and how well your brain works. Because there aren't any crusades happening today, so arguing about the motives of the crusaders may not be that important. You might be on to something there. But with this argument, uh, this is very much live and important stuff. And it's not a settled argument. It's going on all the time. And it involves some of the most powerful people on planet Earth. The President of the United States. The leader of China. Leaders of Powerful European countries like France. Now, I know as Midwestern Americans, it's kind of fashionable for us to laugh at the French. Right? Um, but they are a powerful and wealthy country, and they have a lot of influence in Europe. Same goes for Germany. Germany is the most populous country in Europe. Um, last I checked, they were still the, the world's third largest exporter. Right? And if they're not, they're still going to be in that top five. They are an economic powerhouse. All of these leaders and more are taking different positions on globalization. I want you to be able to understand their arguments and have your own. And part of this is because I also want you to be able to make predictions about globalization's future. And these are predictions that are going to matter for you personally when you're deciding what to do after high school, or maybe even what you decided to do in the remainder of your high school career. So let's say <coughs> Logan here likes to tinker with electronics. 
He likes to build them, likes to repair them, really likes that hands-on side of working with electronics. But Logan also has the know-how to be able to do a little bit more than the hands-on work and actually maybe design electronics. So maybe Logan's got two choices as he moves through high school and beyond. He can seek maybe a factory or production job making electronic components, or go to college, get a degree in engineering, and design those electronics. Now, he may not enjoy the designing part as much as the hands-on, but he can do it. Now, as Logan's weighing up what to do, he needs to predict the future of globalization. And globalization has been kind of going through a rough patch. Um, when I was in high school and when I started teaching about this, it, globalization was locked in. The world was a globalized place. It was only going to get more globalized. And then the financial crisis of 2008 happened. And then COVID happened. And now, fights between the U.S. and China are happening. And all of that's kind of set globalization back a bit. And it may set it back a lot. People are talking now about something called decoupling, where the U.S. and Chinese economies, which have been very closely linked, are going to separate. And they're going to take other countries with them. It's going to be kind of like the Cold War all over again, but more about economics. Logan's got to know which way to jump on that. If Logan is convinced this is just going to be a short-term thing, globalization's going to get it all back together, well, then, Logan, you probably aim for that engineering degree because most of that assembly work is going to happen in Asia. If, on the other hand, Logan thinks globalization is going to be weak, things go the way they are, Logan has a much better chance of being able to get a factory job that pays really good money, doing that hands-on electronics work that he really enjoys, because a lot of that assembly work is going to come back uh, to the United States. So you got to figure out what these possibilities are, which way you think they're going to go as you make your plans for the future. That may be the longest we've ever talked about the objectives, so let's move on right, to tackling that first objective. Right, what is globalization? Turns out, lots of people have lots of different definitions about globalization. We are going to pick one. We're going to use the one from Cambridge University. And this not only tells us what globalization is as a concept, but it also tells us it's three major components, economics, culture, and politics. And globalization, according to this definition, is closer relations in those three ways among all the world's countries as a consequence of communication and transportation becoming easier and, I would add to this, cheaper. For me, one of the examples that kind of pops first into my mind about what easy and cheap travel and communication have made possible is something that you can see. Let's say, Jeremiah, I know you play sports. Maybe you're on your way back from a tournament. You guys stop at a convenience store, and you want to go in and get a bottle of water. Right? And... You've got lots of choices, and one of those is going to be a square bottle that says Fiji on it. Now, Jeremiah, you're probably going to pass that one over because it's still pretty expensive. But uh, if Jeremiah wanted to, right, it's not out of Jeremiah's reach to buy that bottle of water. And that bottle of water has been pumped out of the ground in Fiji. The name is not just coincidence, which is a small island nation in the middle of the Pacific. And it is transported thousands of miles to the United States. I think they even bottle it there. So I think it's sent in bottles 
already to the United States. It's not coming like a big tank and then we bottle it up here. It's already in the bottles. Um, and even if it's not, even if it is in a tank, still, like water is heavy and it takes up a ton of space. And they're transporting it all the way there to the United States. It then goes on trucks to all these different supermarkets and convenience stores all over the country. And that's water. And nobody would have dreamed that you brought the water to people that way. And in the past, People set up their communities where there was already water because it was so hard to move the stuff. Now, nobody gets that excited about bottled water. I get it. So let's talk about Hollywood. And in this case, specifically, Disney is another example. So we've got Disney, an American company, making a movie with actors, voice actors in this case, because it is a cartoon, from different parts of Latin America, translated into multiple languages. Uh, in this case, what we can see uh, is Japanese and I believe also that's the Chinese title that could be, it may actually just be Chinese characters written in for the Japanese language. In any case, an, an American company making a movie about a Latin American country using Latin American voice actors translated into Japanese and tons of other languages and seen all around the world. That is globalization. It's also companies like UPS that will fly things all over the world. You can buy something from Eastern Europe. If you want to pay like 30 bucks, you can probably have it the day after tomorrow or maybe just tomorrow if you start really early in the day. And if you want to pay maybe less than $15, you can get something all the way from Europe to your mailbox in two to three days. And a lot of that it also goes hand in hand with the technological advancements that have made satellite communication and navigation possible. But it's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, and a lot of that sounds like new and shiny stuff, Globalization, some of it is new and shiny, but it has deep and very old roots. And some of those trace back to the granddaddy of all globalization, the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were doing their thing between the 6th century before the birth of Christ up to into the 2nd century before the birth of Christ. Now, you can also use, if you don't like B.C. and A.D., you can use B.C.E. and C.E. Uh, I just dig with B.C. and A.D. one because it's all the same time frame. B.C. and A.D. are shorter and easier to say um, and sound less confusing to me. Okay. That's it. I don't want you guys reading some deeper agenda into that. Now, as you look at this map, and I can't zoom in because Pear Deck will think I want to move to the next slide. But you guys can zoom in on the map. I want you to tell me, using the legends and other things added in here, how do we see economic, cultural, or political relations reflected in what is happening with the Phoenicians? And you don't need to give me all three, just something that you can see in terms of economic, cultural, or political relations. Yes, I think. When Jaden get back gets back. Let's add a little more time on that. Some of you are still writing. In fact, yes, yeah, a full minute.
Yes, Jay. Purple, oh, no, purple really means just purple, like dyes. Uh, it was really hard to make dyes. Like we have synthetic things we can use with chemistry. They had to find them from natural sources. And so purple dye, that's why when you hear somebody talk about a color as royal purple, that's where that comes from. In the past, it was so expensive, only royalty could wear it. Lots of different things. Some of them you could get from minerals. Some of them you could get from plants. Um, some you, I mean, all kinds of different ways. But you, I mean, all of them had to be pretty simply derived from natural things because we didn't know enough to get them any other way. All right, so I'm going to highlight a couple of responses that capture this. So a lot of you focused on right, the trade in stuff, right? And that makes sense. When a lot of us think about globalization, it's that economic stuff that jumps out. Right, we get that. Jaden asked about purple. Yeah, purple travels. It gets sent to Egypt. Right? Um, we also have trade in ivory coming from Africa. Naturally, people trade for things they don't have. Right? And so going to Africa would be things like maybe grains or gold in exchange for tusks. We also see in some of these shaded areas, right, the spread of Greek culture. That's also something that's happening in this globalization. It was called um, Hellenization, um, and that was an important part of globalization in this era as well. Right, we also see politically that the Phoenicians are setting up settlements in what becomes the Holy Land along the coast of North Africa, along the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula in Western Europe. So also political. Now, it's fair if somebody's pointing out um, that that does not look like a map of the entire Earth. It's not. That's, just, that's the Mediterranean Sea. You've got Europe, you've got Asia, you've got Africa. But that's still three continents. And then also, this is a really long time ago. Even moving stuff by water is dangerous and difficult a lot of this is going to be done with ships powered by oars. That is really expensive to do. You have to feed those people uh, running those oars. Our next bit of globalization stretches things out a bit more geographically. It's the ancient Silk Road. And this is going to pick up, you're going to see that these periods kind of overlap. Right, one ends, the other begins. Right, that's not always a coincidence, as we're going to see in a couple of steps towards globalization uh, later today, right, but the Silk Roads. And just to put this in some context for what we know, um, from the 100s BC through the 400s AD, that's some of the area of the rise and decline of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire and China are linked by the Silk Road. So if it's China and Rome, we're talking about Asia to Europe. So a much longer stretch. There's that same Mediterranean Sea, and we're now stretched clear out here from the heart of China all the way to Rome, right, connecting two ancient civilizations. Right, so this sounds like much more globalization, but be careful. It's over a wider territory, but the relationship is pretty shallow. And by that, I don't mean that it's based on looks. What I mean is it doesn't involve that much stuff. And it doesn't involve that many people. This is about luxury goods. And if you notice something on this map, it pretty much moves by land. And these camels sprinkled on the picture are not just there to make it prettier. These goods are moving largely by camel caravans. They are slow. They are vulnerable to robbery and ambush. It's pretty tough to move things. So you're only going to move stuff that's worth a lot of money. Those would be luxury goods. Which in this period, things like silk. Silk is made by silkworms eating mulberry leaves. That's it. But... Nobody knew that except for the Chinese, and they kept it secret. 
and it was also spices. At this time, spices could be um, quite literally worth their weight in gold, maybe even more than worth their weight in gold. So the only people getting these are the richest of the rich. So it's very thin and shallow globalization. Our next step forward expands the geographic scope even more and adds in a little more development. This one runs from the 600s to the 1400s. This is all AD, right? so the 7th century through the 15th century. Right. And it is the lines in blue. The lines we see in red are still more of our Silk Road. And this is indeed the Muslim spice trade. It is conducted by Muslims, and they dominate the territory, especially on the coasts and the sea lanes. And what makes this a not only bigger globalization in terms of geography, but also a deeper globalization is that it's got a distinct cultural element. With the spice trade, Muslims also spread their religion to Southeast Asia, as far as modern-day Indonesia. Now, what I want you to do is just kind of press your geographical knowledge. Where is Indonesia on that map? Just drag the purple dot to where you think it is. It'll take about 15 seconds out of this 30-second timer. All right. Indonesia is here. All right. Now, I know that says Java, and that can throw you. The different islands have different names. Now that we know where Indonesia is, let's compare that map to the map we were familiar with from previous classes. The dreamed of caliphate of the Islamists. So put that together with what we're learning about the Muslim spice trade and tell me, how does that trade from 600 to almost a millennia and a half ago help us understand why Islamists have the goals that they have today in terms of building that caliphate? It's a tough question, but give it your best. And somebody in third hour hit the nail right on the head. Yes, Jack. Uh, so Asia and Indonesia. Yep.
Yeah, that's fine, Jake. All right. Now I will tell you, nobody hit the nail on the head this time. That's okay. I said it's a, it's a tough question. Some of you definitely put a lot of thought. May have been more of a problem of overthinking it. This helps us understand the goals of the Islamists today because now we can, like, a lot of people can understand, oh, well, they would want this part because that's where, like, that's the heartland historically of Islam. Um, maybe you know a little bit more, like, well, there are a lot of uh, Muslims in India and, of course, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But where people start to have questions is, like, well, why this? When most people think of Southeast Asia and religion, they think of Buddhism. But Indonesia is different because of the spice trade. If you ask somebody, what is the Muslim country with the largest population, a lot of people would think, well, it's probably Saudi Arabia, or maybe it's Iran, or maybe Turkey. Uh, but no, it is Indonesia. Clearly, Indonesia. And that is because of the spice trade. Okay, next up, we have the Age of Exploration. And this is the map right, that truly looks like globalization. We've got every continent on the globe with the exception of Antarctica. And we have these lines representing different groups of explorers fanning out all over the world. And even this line that seems to stop here, and this line that seems to start out of nowhere, those are the same lines. Those are explorers sailing the whole way around the globe. This is happening as the spice trade, the, the Islamic spice trade, the Muslim spice trade is ending. And this is one of those overlaps that is not a coincidence. As we're going to see in more detail later, European Christians take over the route of the Muslim spice trade from the Muslims and then also start to spread out over more of the world. And this age of exploration led by Christians from Europe is often referred to as the age of discovery. Now, don't actually worry about the pair deck on this one. I forgot to delete it. Um, it's less frequently called the age of discovery. Some people are still kind of touchy about changing the name. The problem with the label Age of Discovery is if you say you discovered something, nobody's ever found it before. If Alexis in a lab should find a brand new element to add to the periodic table, that's a discovery. Right? Nobody's ever found that before. But we should probably call this instead the Age of Exploration. And more and more teachers and more and more textbooks do. The reason for this is exploration simply means um, that you are learning about something that is new to you. Not new to other people, but new to you. If Jaden May wants to go explore in the woods at the west side of Krug Park, Jaden can do that. Jaden, there's some pretty neat stuff back there. There's some Nice creeks, maybe you've seen this before, a little waterfall over some limestone. It's nice, but you didn't discover it. I'm older than you. I, I beat you to it. Just purely by the fact that you weren't alive, I'm sure, by the first time I went back there. So Jaden's exploring, even if he's not discovering. And that's still a nice thing to do, but it's not discovering. The Europeans are not discovering the Americas. There are millions of people already living there. Same with Australia and some of the other places they stopped that had been fairly isolated. Now that's where we're going to stop. Tomorrow we'll pick up with what enabled the age of exploration. But for now, go ahead and save these. And because we're already finished with this notes document, I encourage you to go ahead and upload it before you forget. And then head back for the exit slip. What's up, Jaden Frisbee? That one?
Or no. Oh. That one? Yes. Uh, so not right now. There is a recording and you can get them later, but we're about to do our exit slip. Okay. And Jaden, I will put that back up. Uh, your exit slip is going to be the same as the do now about our ancient civilizations. And guys, so far, we are on track to go to three days in a row. Make sure those earbuds and phones stay away. That we avoid that temptation to whisper. Use your notes, take your time, and good luck. Jaden, there are the notes when you're ready to get the rest of them. Here and come back to that and your bench. 